That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Rabari, do you hear Rabbi Marcus now? Yes, I do. Um, okay, Rabbi Ephraim, take it away. Okay. Good evening and welcome to our annual Yom HaShoah commemoration program. We're fortunate to have as our keynote speaker, from Daniel Gladstein, who will be addressing the Arab role in the Holocaust, reflections on the Shoah through the prism of October 7th. Tonight's program is sponsored by Lunishma Savi Murray, Rabbi Aaron Dov Berb, and Rabbi Ephraim Zaprenal of Racha, a survivor of the Shoah who dedicated himself to Holocaust education. I note the, the participation of Imi Marasi, Tibod Alachayim Toiv Varuchim, as well as Rabbi Yoel Schoenfeld, who has been so instrumental in these programs over the years. We will open the program by calling upon Rav Moshe Rosenberg, Morada Asra of Congregation Eitz Chaim, to lead us in Kapitel Kufchof Aleph, Le'ilu Nishmas to Kedoshe HaShoah, and in the merit of Achenu Kol Beis Yisrael, followed by Rav Daniel Rosenfeld, Morada Asra of Young Israel Kew Gardens Hills, who will lead us in Kapitel Kuf Lamed. Rabbi Rosenberg. Shir la ma'alos esoin ayal leharim me'ayin yavo ezri ezri me'yim adonai osei shomayim bo'aretz al yitain lamot raglecha al yonum shomarecha hinei lo yonum velo yishan shomer yisrael Adonai Shomarecha, Adonai Tzelacha, Al Yad Yeminecha. Yomom Hashem Eshlo Yakeka, V'yareach Balo Yela. Adonai Yishmorecha Mikol Ra, Yishmores Nafshecha. Adonai Yishmor Tzesecha Uvoecha, Me'ato V'yad Olam. Rabbi Rosenfeld. Shira Malos, Mamakim, Krasicha Adonai, Adonai, Shimabakoli, Tiena as Necha, Kashavos, the Kota Hanunai, E. Mabonos Tishpoya, Adonai, Miamod, Kim Kasicha, the Manti Vare, Givisi Adonai, Gibson, Nafshi, Vilibaro, Hokti, Nafshi Adonai, me, Shomrim La Boker, Shomrim La Boker. Yahel Yisrael Adonai, Kim Adonai Chesed, Rame Mopedus, Behu Yiftes Yisrael, Mikol Avono Sav. Achenu Kobes Yisrael, and it's Unim Sav Shivya, and the Mevayel of Isha, and the Kamir Achem Alev, and the Siamet Saral of Rachel, and the Pale Rome Shibud of Allah, Hashtabag Alev is not Kurivan in my remain. I now call upon Rav Shmuel Marcus, Murad Asra of Young Israel of Queens Valley, for introductory remarks. Thank you, Rav Shayim, Rav Schoenfeld, Rosenfeld, Rosenberg, Abonim, and participants on this uh, Zoom call, Zoom lecture. Thank you, Rav Glastin, for honoring us this evening with your lecture. The evening, of course, is sponsored with Zephyr Mishmas and Dov Berger, Rav Shayim's father. We're grateful to Rav Shayim's efforts for many years already in bringing this Yom HaShul program to our shul, to our shuls, to the community. Uh, Glastin's title and topic is very, very appropriate, unfortunately, for the time, both because it is Yom HaShoah and also because of the increased wave of anti-Semitism that we are experiencing here and abroad around the world in Eretz Yisrael, a direct result of Islamic anti-Semitism. None other than the Rambam himself writing, perhaps, about seven centuries ago, in a letter entitled the Geras Teimon, the Rambam writes, you should know, my brothers, that this nation, the Umas Yishmael, referring to the Arab Muslim nation, that causes us great persecution, and tries to find religious laws of their own, to do evil to us, to abhor us. And Rama writes that there has been no nation that has done more evil to us than this nation, which is a striking comment. No other nation, says the Rambam, that has 
done so much to humiliate us and to generate hatred of us like they have. Again, very striking comments written by the Ramam, who, after all, was a successful physician in Egypt, famous and respected both in Jewish and Muslim society. And yet he himself writes that the Umas Yishmal, the Muslim nation, the Muslim people, have done more than any other nation to strengthen hatred of us and to humiliate us and to persecute us. This, of course, is written, like I said, seven centuries ago, and sadly, over the subsequent centuries, much more has happened by way of terrible suffering for Christ and Gaulus, not just at the hands of Muslims, but at the hands of Christians, and no doubt. And it is not for us to declare who is a worse enemy in the course of Jewish history has done more to harm us and to hurt us. But one thing is certain, as Rabbi Glassstein will speak about, when it came to the Shoah and the Nazi designs to murder and to eliminate as many Jews as possible, it was the Mufti, the Muslim Mufti of Jerusalem, who was hand-in-hand, eager supporting Hitler's efforts. And it is certainly a very, very sobering reminder, painful reminder, that Kal Yisrael, has to always be mindful of the fact that in Lanu, Amile Shine El Alavina Shiva Shemaim, we turn only to a Kurdish Baruchu for our support, for our ongoing salvation. We have to strengthen our moon and be talking to Kurdish Baruchu because when we see from both the left and the right, or as Ramam writes in one other letter, from east and west, so many who are seeking to harm us, who seek to hate us, we are reminded that. In Amle Vadar, we are alone. We dwell alone. We are unique. We are distinct. We have to appreciate and respect that uniqueness and that distinction that Kaddish Baruch Hu has blessed us with. And only when we recognize and appreciate our true distinction, only then, as in the Siv writes, in Amle Vadar, only then you're shown, only then we will be blessed to dwell securely. And we hope that with the added appreciation of the fact that we are always the subject of anti Semitic hatred we should be reminded that ultimately we have to be proud of our distinction, of our uniqueness, and strengthen and reinforce our bitachah and our Baruch Hu as the true source of our Yishtua Sashtas. Thank you, Rabbi Marcus. Rav Daniel Gladstein is the Mora the Asra of Gehilas Teferis, Mordechai of Cedarhurst, and a prolific author of the well-received Sifrei Magid Harakia, both in Lush and Kodesh and in English. He's a sought-after speaker who really needs no introduction. Time permitting, he will entertain questions after the program. Please post any questions on Zoom. At this time, it is a great cover for me to introduce Rav Daniel Gladstein. Hmm. Hey, good evening, everyone. Did you hear me? Yes. Yes. Could be a little louder if you have a, if you can adjust it. Good evening, everyone. Could you hear me? How's that? Okay, good. It's a distinct honor to speak on this uh, platform at this venue, which is Leloy Nishmas, Rev. Martin Dov Berger, Rev. Aaron Dov Berger, someone who devoted his life to Holocaust education. Bershus esteemed Rabbanim. This is a subject that is very personal to me, as my grandfather and my grandmother were Holocaust survivors. My grandfather, Rav Mordechai Leib Gladstein, was one of the great spiritual heroes of the Holocaust, was one of the great activists in the post-Holocaust era. He was the head of the religious department of the Joint Distribution Committee after the war. He later became a Rav in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he served as a Rav for 70 years. He passed away a few years ago at 106 years old. He was a Talmud Muvak of Rav Menachem Zemba and pre-war Gedolim. I've spoken about my grandfather many times, including at this venue, at the Young Israel of Queens Valley, back, back in, the, in the day when I was a Rav in uh, Kew Garden Hills about 10 years ago. This evening, I would like to share with you an incident that my grandfather recorded in his personal memoirs and use this incident as a prism to view the events that are unfolding before our eyes events in Eretz Yisrael, events around the world, and use it as a prism to understand October 7th. You may hear people say October 7th, 
the massacre, it was a tragedy. It was worse than the Holocaust. You may hear people speak that way. This is how people talk. With any degree of study or analysis, one immediately realized not only the fallacy of such a claim, but the absurdity of it. In sheer numbers, obviously, this claim has no standing. But why should we be the one to be the judge on this issue? Recently, this question was posed to Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau, who, of course, was a renowned survivor as a child. And when he was posed with this question, he listened to the question rather respectfully, and he was specifically asked, you know, Rabbi Lau, after the war, your brother told you, look, you can't stay here in Europe. In Europe, they kill Jews. Go to Palestine. In Israel, they don't kill Jews. And now in light of what happened on October 7th, how do you feel about that? Where this happened in the land of Israel? And Rabbi Lau said in response that when people say October 7th, they slaughtered women, they slaughtered children. It's like the Holocaust. He says, I deny that. It's not like the Holocaust. But it's interesting how he put it. He said, during the Holocaust, we were helpless. So they could kill six million in three years. No one came to our aid. Not the Americans, not the British, not the French. Yeah, they fought Hitler. They fought the Nazis, but they didn't fight to save Jewish lives. They didn't fight to save Jews. Nobody ever declared, you know, we need to go into Europe and save innocent people, an innocent nation who committed no crime. Nobody ever said that. Not Roosevelt, not Churchill, not Stalin, not De Gaulle. Nobody ever said we need to help innocent Jews. But, but today, Rabbi Lau said, today we have a homeland. Today we have an army. Today Jews are willing to risk their lives to protect the citizens of the state of Israel. And he said in 1948, in the War of Independence, we defeated seven Arab nations. And then in 1956, and then the Six-Day War, we defeated on three fronts, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and then seven years later in the Yom Kippur War. We were caught off guard, but still, in 18 days, we defeated our opponent, and we won the war. Did the United States of America ever win a war in six days? Did they ever win a war in 18 days? Did they ever win in 18 days in Korea, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq? Russia and Ukraine, they're still at it. Did any of them finish in six days or in 18 days? It's almost two years. So how did we do it? So Rabbi Lau said, and i just repeating his words, because we have a father in heaven who wants us to be in Eretz Yisrael. These were his words when he was asked to compare October 7th to the Holocaust. But I would like to share with you this evening an incident my grandfather recorded in his personal memoirs that I believe will give us a perspective not only on October 7th, but the entirety of the Holocaust. My grandfather recorded that when he was in Auschwitz, he personally witnessed with his own eyes. He saw Eichmann. And Eichmann invited a special guest to join him in Auschwitz. His name was Haj Amin El Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. That's the title that the British gave him because they didn't know what to do with him. And they were standing in arm in arm and embrace like two lovers. And for their enter entertainment, they would march Jews in front of them and they would beat them in a way that the Jew would never be able to reproduce. That was the entertainment of Eichmann and the Mufti. And then my grandfather wrote, that in his opinion, this meeting of Eichmann and the Mufti was a fruition of the Pasuk and Parshas Todois, Vayelach Esav El Yishmael, Vayikach Es Machalas Bas Yishmael. And when I saw this, this was quite frightening and quite compelling to me because there's a chilling revelation of the Vilna Gain. In his commentary to a Kabbalistic work called Safra de Tzniusa, where the Vilna Gaon reveals to us that throughout our history, like Rabbi Marcus mentioned, we've had two enemies. We have Esav and Yishmael, and they're compared to two animals, a shar and a chamar, an ox and a donkey. Esav is compared to a shar, 
like it says, parim abirim, mighty bulls. Yishmal, however, is compared to a chamar. Shavu lachem poyim hachamar. Says the Vilna Goyen, that's the deeper reason we cannot plow with an ox and a donkey together. Because if Esav and Yishmal would ever come together, says the Gera, they would but go forth and destroy the entire world. So to me, if you want to get a picture of what the world would look like if Esav and Yishmael ever, ever got together, Auschwitz. What my grandfather saw in Auschwitz is what the world would look like if Esav and Yishmael ever got together. By the way, in fact, the Vilna Goyen understands is an amazing interpretation. You know, we usually understand. The Pasuk says, Vayistoim Esav es Yaakov. Al habracha shebracha Esav hated Yaakov. So what did he do about it? So we read the end of the Pasuk. Vayoymer Esav belibay, yikrivu yimei evel avi. I'll wait until dad passes on, and then I'll kill Yaakov. Says the Gra, yeah, but how's he going to accomplish that? Says the Vilna Gain, you have to read a few psukim later. What was Esav's plan? The plan to annihilate Yaakov was Vayelech Esav el Yishmael. That's the Vilna Gain. By the way, there's one other time in history where we encounter a union of Esav and Yishmael. When is that? It's the only time in the history of the Jewish people that there was a looming threat, lahashmid, laroig, ulaabed, es kol hayehudim, minar v'yadzakein. But to appreciate this, I have to share with you a brief maral, but this is going to be uh, history, not divrei Torah, but listen to this. The maral wonders, you know, the Midrashim always repeatedly speak about the four Golosim, the four exiles, Bavel, Babylon, Paras, Persia, Yavon, Greece, Edom, Rome. And the Maral wants to know what happened to Yishmael. Why is Yishmael not on the list? Does Yishmael not brutalize the Jewish people? Have they not subjugated the Jewish people? Why don't they make the list? By the way, it's worthwhile to know, according to Ibn Ezra, they are on the list. Rome and Rome is part of Greece and the fourth exile is Yishmael. But the Maral says Chazal never have accepted that. Throughout the Medrash Rabbah, numerous places, the four Golosim, the four exiles, are Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. What about Yishmael? Why isn't Yishmael on the list? Says the Maral. He offers two approaches. This is the approach he likes better. Says the Maral. Paras, Persia, encompasses Golos Yishmael. How so? Says the Maral. They have the same personality. The way the Gemara describes their personality, they wage wars. They conquer cities. Persia is a code word for Yishmael. Thus, accordingly, the Purim story comes to new light. Do you understand now the danger of Ahasuerus and Haman uniting? Ahasuerus is king of Persia. Persia encompasses Yishmael. Haman is Esav. When they get together, it's a disaster. You have the Gezerah. Lahashmid, Laroig, Ulaabed, as Kola Yehudim. And in light of what happened on October 7th, it is worthwhile to study the Holocaust. And what role, if any, did the Arab world have in the final solution? You know, in fact, after October 7th, claims were made, by the way, by Netanyahu himself, that the final solution was the brainchild of Haj Amin al-Husseini who suggested killing the Jews rather than Hitler's original proposal of uh, merely expelling them. And Netanyahu purport, uh, suggested that this took place in a meeting between al-Husseini and Hitler on November 28th, 1941. And then considerable controversy erupted because uh, it is actually accessible today and available, the record of the conversation between Hitler and the Grand Mufti. But it should not be a controversy because by all accounts, Al-Husseini opened up the meeting with the following introduction. Al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti, tells Hitler that you Germans and we Arabs, we have the same enemy. Al-Husseini then proposed to Hitler, by all accounts, Arab revolt across the Middle East to eliminate the Jewish population in the Middle East. So whether the final solution was the brainstorm of the Grand Mufti or not, 
There is no question that was certainly his ambition. Furthermore, Al Husseini founded the Palestinian movement in 1919. Don't take my word for it. Yasser Arafat called him the father of the Palestinian people. He was personally responsible for many terrorist attacks on the Jews living in the British Mandate in Palestine. He, and he organized these attacks in his role that the British promoted him to as the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. By the way, the most devastating of any of these revolts was between 1936 and 1939, the Arab revolts, which only ended with the outbreak of World War II. He created so much chaos that the British had to intervene. He, the Grand Mufti goes to Iraq, where he carried so much, uh, so much prestige in the Muslim world that he was able, they gave him a budget, they gave him an allowance. He organized what is known as the Farhud, which were the terrible pogroms against the Jews in Iraq, which eliminated a significant uh, sector of the population of Jews in Baghdad. He then goes on to Italy, where he is received as some kind of head of state. He goes to Berlin. Hitler rolls out the red carpet for the Mufti. They gave him his own bureaucracy. They called it Bureau des Gras Mufti. What does he do? He's prominent in Nazi propaganda. He allies the Muslims with the Nazis in Bosnia, in Kosovo. He arranged different divisions of Himmler's SS. But what is most telling that I just discovered today is that at the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal, they interrogated Eichmann's right-hand man, Dieter Wislesini. He was Czechoslovakian. He was an evil Satan. And he was interviewed extensively by the prosecutors. As evil as he was, that's how good of a witness he was. He answered every question meticulously. You could watch the testimony. He implicated the Mufti in the final solution. By the way, and incredibly, I sent the transcript to Ephraim. So if you want it, you could get it from Rabbi Ephraim. At the Eichmann trial, Attorney General Gidon Hausner read excerpts of Wislasini's statement that he read it at the Eichmann trial that when Eichmann agreed in exchange to save a transport of Jewish children in exchange for civilian prisoners, the Mufti objected vigorously. He came to Himmler. He said, if you save the life of these Jewish children, they will end up strengthening the Jewish settlement in Palestine. By the way, he raised divisions of Muslim that fought in the Nazi army. One of their jobs was to guard the trains taking Jews to death camps. They were to make sure that no Jews escaped. By the way, together with Himmler, he would visit the death camps and he even drew plans to build a facility in Samaria where the 500,000 Jews who lived in Palestine would also be exterminated. But what's very interesting is that somehow after the Oslo Accords in 1993, the large prominent picture of Hitler and the Mufti that Rabbi Fryam used in the, advert in the flyer for tonight's event, that prominent picture that hung in Yad Vashem Somehow, after the Oslo Accord, it was replaced with a smaller picture of Husseini and Himmler, and it was put off in a corner. And then one has to wonder if it's no longer politically correct to implicate the Grand Mufti in his role as collaborator in the Holocaust. But growing up with this image that my grandfather recorded of him seeing the Mufti and Eichmann, arm in arm in Auschwitz, there is no question about the important role that the Mufti played. And this should give us a perspective of October 7th, that what was perpetrated was not an isolated event. It was simply the fulfillment of the legacy of the fatherhead of the Palestinians, the man who Arafat dubbed the father of the Palestinians. This is their tradition that they have from the Grand Mufti. So regarding the question, is October 7th, was it worse than the Holocaust? I believe 
The straightforward answer is it's not worse than the Holocaust. It is simply a continuation of the Holocaust. And with this background and in this context, I'd like to share and to highlight one of the most miraculous episodes ever to occur to our people in the last hundred years, perhaps in our entire history. And it's an episode that we really should focus on more. And it's a very inspiring aspect of the Holocaust, but a frightening one. I want to speak about the desert fox. The desert fox was approaching and Palestine was in terror. February 12th, German General Erwin Rommel arrives in North Africa. His reputation preceded him. During the lightning fast six-week German push that swallowed France whole in 1940, he's the first German panzer tank commander to reach the English Channel. By the way, Rommel had many decades of exper experience. In 1917, in October, when Germany was fighting against Italy, Rommel led a group of only 300 men to capture an entire Italian gun battery situated all the way up on a mountain 5,400 feet in the air. With a few extra troops, he surrounded with 300 men. He surrounded 2,000 Italian soldiers. The next morning, together with two other officers and a few well-trained Alpine infantry, he rushed into the camp of Italian Salerno Brigade. He takes 1,500 prisoners he doesn't stop for sleep. He pushed his men off the mountain to finish off the stronghold of the last defenders. This is Rommel. Rommel had the most mystique of any general in world history. In 1934, a year after Hitler comes to power, Rommel swears allegiance to the Fuhrer. Churchill would say about Rommel, he's a very daring and skillful opponent and shall I say, a great general. The Brits were enamored and terrified of Rommel. His abilities intimidated him. They ha he haunted them. Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda minister, wrote in his diary, the English press has made him one of the most popular generals in the entire world. And that's quite all right, Goebbels said. Rommel deserves it. Rommel's mystique began to play with England's psyche to the point, this is incredible, the general of England's army, C.J. Auchinleck, he ordered one of the most bizarre orders in history. Listen to what he sent to his troops. There is real danger that Ramo is becoming a mystical enemy for our troops in view of the fact that that's all they talk about. However energetic or capable he may be, he's no superhuman. Even if he were superhuman, it's undesirable for our troops to endow him with supernatural abilities. We must make every effort to destroy the concept that Rommel is anything more than an ordinary German general. This matter is of great psychological significance, signed C.J. Auchinleck. So could you imagine, instead of dealing with Rommel with military prowess, they had to use therapy to, use, to deal with Rommel. More than the Nazis, more than Germany, the world was afraid of Rommel. Churchill was once overheard saying, Rommel, 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 Rommel! What are we going to do with Rommel? Nothing else matters except for Rommel. Rommel's blitzing through North Africa at lightning speed with the motto, and now for complete destruction of the enemy. June 29th, Rommel attacks Mirsa Matru, with German and Italian troops, it falls. Rommel takes 6,000 prisoners. Rommel wrote, we are now 125 miles from Alexandria. Rommel's army was progressing with unheard of speed. They were covering 25 miles a day. Rommel is primed to invade El Alamein. The British had already started evacuating their families from Palestine. According to experts, it would be only 10 days Rommel would be in control of the entire Palestine. On June 29th, Rommel observed that El Alamein was the last obstacle to advance on to Alexandria. British General Auchinleck wanted to stop the Panzer Army at El Alamein, but realistically, he realized it was impossible. He had defenses set up as far as the Gaza Strip. 
The Egyptians swore allegiance to Hitler. The Egyptians hung swastikas from their windows. They cried out as the British troops were retreating, advance Rommel, advance Rommel. After so many British defeats, Rommel lost all respect for the Brits as soldiers. June 29th, guess who shows up? Mussolini. Mussolini's riding his favorite horse on which he planned to attend the Cairo Victory Parade. Rommel's forces are primed to move eastward. The Yishuv in Eretz Yisrael was in panic. Air raid shelters are built. German planes bombed the central bus station. In Tel Aviv, Italian planes bombed Yushalayim. A bomb landed near Shari Tzedek Hospital. Fear was palpable in the land of Israel, in Palestine of the time, and for good reason. They started modifying vans with the exhaust pipe moved inward so that Hitler would be able to gas whatever Jews were in Palestine. And the Arabs were welcoming Hitler's forces with open arms. By the way, back in 1938, articles appeared in Arab newspapers in which they equated Hitler with Mohammed. In other words, in their eyes, there was only one person in history on par with Mohammed, Hitler. In 1940, you know, bear this in mind today, King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia let Hitler know that he has the greatest respect and admiration for the Fuhrer. 1941, Egypt's King Farouk sends a message He's filled with admiration for the Fuhrer and, and the German people. In Cairo, they reported that in Islamic culture, Hitler is credited with supernatural powers and they deem him a prophet who has come to oppose the Jewish people. Already in July, it was inevitable. The Arabs were so in, emboldened that they stopped selling produce that the Brits gave them to give to the Jews. They stopped selling it. Now, as Rommel's moving closer, common greeting of Arabs in Palestine. You say, good morning. No, good morning. Hail Hitler. That's how they spoke. Swastikas were seen hanging from windows, from cars. Even the shoeshine men stationed near Yaffa Gate, they decorated their boxes with swastikas. What were they selling? The top-selling book, Mein Kampf, other Nazi, uh, Nazi literature were being sold in Arabic. This is their Baruch Haba. This was going to be their Baruch Haba for Rommel. The Arabs broadcast on the radio, Jews, we're going to swim in your blood. We're going to abuse your wives. We're going to murder your children. As Rommel's getting closer, the Jews noticed chalk marks appear on their homes. And nobody could explain it, but eventually it was discovered that confident in Rommel's arrival, they were staking claims of the Jewish houses. So there were fights. There were fist fights breaking out in the street. You know, which house would go to which Arab? The Arabs had such a close alliance with Hitler. As we mentioned before, the Grand Mufti and Hitler met in 1941. And he too, by the way, when he came to Berlin, they gave the Mufti a monthly allowance of 75,000 Reichmarks just to paint the picture of what it was like then. By the way, a lot of what I'm telling you comes from this book, uh, Miracle at El Alamein, by a friend of mine, Rebzev Paretsky. He brings an account that as Rommel's forces approached Eretz Yisrael, a boy says he sees his father laying in bed, and he's about 12 years old, and, and he sees his father's in such pain, he says, uh, Dad, you know, what's... What's wrong? He said, my son, I have to tell you, the time has come. You need to know the Germans are almost in the land. But you need to, th you need to know that before the Germans get here, the Arabs want to present the Germans with a present. So they've created four manufacturing locations of knives so that they could present the Germans with dead Jews and do the dirty work for them. The danger seemed so inevitable that many Jews in the Yishuv contemplated suicide. This is an account of a woman who escaped Poland with her family. She says it's difficult to describe, even after what she went through in Poland, the terror that struck us. 
I looked up at the green trees. I looked up at the blue sky. I saw how beautiful life was. Too bad, I thought to myself, we're going to have to take leave of it quite soon. There were 500,000 Jews living in the land of Palestine, and it seemed inevitable that they didn't have much longer left. But what is not so well known is that the Jews of Palestine, of Eretz Yisrael, were determined to do everything at their disposal to change the Gzeira that had already decimated European Jewry. But what could they do? You know, Moshe Dayan was busy organizing guerrilla groups to stop the invasion, but it was considered somewhat of a laughable attempt. What ensued was one of the most inspiring accounts in the history of the Jewish people. And something we need to study and remember what type of power we have when we galvanize and we come together and we storm the heavens in sincere tefillah. The holy tzaddikim of Eretz Yisrael, communities of righteous Jews, they join together in unprecedented prayer. Let me give you a few examples. Rav Shmuel Hillel Schenker, son-in-law of Rav Yosef Chaim Zonnefeld, he gathers together 10 Mekubal Yishalayim. They circle the land from one end to the other reciting prayers and various shemais. One of the tzaddikim that Rav Shanker had with him, Rav Ruven Bengis, who later became the Rav Yushalayim. The Briskarov decreed that the recital of Tehillim cannot stop even for a moment. They set up mishmarois around the clock. At this, at this very time, it happened to be, we're going to speak about soon, the yard side of the Arachayim HaKadosh. It was Tesvav Tamaz. Thousands gathered at the kever of the Archaim HaKadosh. Thousands gathered in Meiron in, at Shimon HaTzadik. They set up fast days. The shuls were full. In some yeshivas, they decreed a Tainas Dibor for two days. There was a tzaddik, Rav Mendel Gefner. He is one of the tzaddikim who conceived of the large-scale Berchus Kaihanim that we have today at the Kaisal. He encircles Yushalayim seven times. Rav Menachem Parush recalled when the German army led by Rommel stood at the gates of Eretz Yisrael for three days and nights we stood and said to Hillem without stop eating, sleeping, cry, we just cried and wailed. A man recounted that he heard from his mother that when she first came to Yishalayim she's a war refugee. She went to pray at the Kosa Maravel and she, she's entering the Shuk at Yaffa Gate and she hears crying at Yaffa Gate Coming from the Kaisa Ma'aravi, she asked, well, what is this crying? These were the wails of people at the wailing wall, crying over their predicament. Everyone across the land, uh, pretty much, even the non-religious, fasted that year on Shiva Asubatamas. Even those, even communists, even socialists, the Jewish people united in fasting. Now, one of the great Mikubalim of the time was Rabbi Huda Fataya. You know, I always think my grandparents, my grandmother, was the daughter of the last Rav of Sachachav. His name was Rabbi Huda Leib Volman Hashem Yimkam Damai. He was killed in the Warsaw Ghetto. And she survived first as a sewer rat, and then she masqueraded as a, a Polish peasant. She's buried on Har Hazesim, next to this great Mekubal. His name is Rabbi Huda Fataya. Rabbi Huda Fataya was a, a wondrous Mekubal. He gathered 60 tzaddikim, Mekubalim, workers, scholars from the Iraqi community. And they went to Kever Rachel. Next door to Kever Rachel was a big mansion with diplomats. They couldn't sleep the whole night from the crying of Rabbi Huda Fataya. We're going to come back to Rabbi Huda Fataya, but another feat he pulled off is he went to the British Air Force and he asked the British Air Force if they could fly him around the length of circle the land of Israel in air. And he circled Eretz Yisrael saying Kabbalistic prayers. The Leleva Rebbe, one of the saintly mystical figures, Ramosh Shemur Mordechai Biederman, he left his home, he moved into a small room in the old city, for 40 days, he stood there in uninhabitable conditions where the Lelva Rebbe poured out his heart 
And after he finished 40 days in the old city, he went up north to the Kever Rameer Balanes, where he spent another 40 days and he slept on the floor next to the Kever. Husatina Rebbe. Unfortunately, it's not a name that's so well known because we don't really have Husatina Chasidos. He led the Tfilos by the Kever the Archaim HaKadosh. And incredibly, it was the yard site was Tesvav Tamos. That week is Parshas Balak, where the Archaim HaKadosh makes this very mystical statement where he says, he's commenting on the Pasuk, Darach Koychav Miyakov become Sheva Yisrael. Why does the Pasuk begin with Yaakov and end with Yisrael? And the Archaim HaKadosh Kabbalistically says that there, if the Jewish people are on a low level, the level of Yaakov, relative to Yisrael, then he writes, Mashiach ben Ephraim, which is a new concept, Mashiach ben Ephraim will be killed by Romulus, the Archaim HaKadosh says. And if Kalei will be on a high level, then Romulus will not win. Now, who exactly is Romulus that the Archaim HaKadosh is talking about? Some say it was the son of Bilam, some say it's the father head of Rome, but these tzaddikim, they took the words of the Archaim HaKadosh to somehow supernaturally be referring to the predicament with Ramel. The Imre Emes, by the way, I'm remembering now, I am in possession of the letter the Imre Emes wrote in the aftermath of the Holocaust to be Mechazik, the survivors. My grandfather had it. The Imre Emes, the Ger Rebbe, when he passed by the shuls in Yushalayim, it was a Thursday night, and he hears the heartfelt voice of the Tfilois emanating from these Yidin, he said he is batuach that Ramo will be stopped in his tracks. But by the way, the Gareba then said one of the most frightening things I ever heard. And you could see all of, everything I'm telling you is annotated. This is a statement of the Gareba. Again, I'm not telling you my opinion, but if you want to know the subject, you need to know the statement. The Gareba said, it's a frightening statement. It's not something we could say on our own. The Gareba said that if the Rabbanim in Poland would have gathered the people the way the Rabbanim in Eretz Yisrael did, they would have been warded off, they would have been able to be successful to protect the Jews in Poland. The Gareba was not the only one who said that. Rabbi Meshulam David Salavechik, the son of the Briskorov, said, same statement, who knows what would have happened if they did in Poland what they did in Eretz Yisrael. Rav Aaron Leib Steinman said he personally heard from the Chazonish. And it's printed in Chazonish's biography in Masayish, page 103. Had they done in Europe what they did in Eretz Yisrael, they would have been able to save the Jews of Europe. But don't think for a second that this is an indictment of the Rabbanim of Europe because at the Levaya of the Chazonish, Rav Shmuel Greinemann got up and he said, that the reason that the Rabbanim in Europe didn't is min hashamayim. There was a certain Hester Panim where they were not completely aware of the impending disaster. So they didn't have the wherewithal to organize such things. But in Eretz Yisrael, like in the times of Mordechai and Esther, Jews, religious, irreligious, they came together. They banged down the gates of prayer and they nullified the decree. And what happened was nothing short of one of the most stunning upsets in military history. The Desert Fox, one of the most cunning generals, was stopped in his tracks at El Alamein. This was the turning point in the war. One historian writes that after three years, Alamein was the first indisputable victory against a German-led army. Churchill wrote that you could practically say before al we never had a victory. After al we never had a defeat. How do we explain this? The German generals were struggling to explain. This is what they came up with. Field Marshal Albert Kisserling later wrote, I am convinced that this battle would have been no problem for the old Rommel, Kisserling claimed. Rommel, he said, had a nervous breakdown in Africa, was hospitalized, he was depressed, mainly at Alamein, he's not the same Rommel anymore. Here's another turning point. Here's another miraculous occurrence. Hitler surprisingly decided to attack Russia. 
this was considered a grave error. When the tzaddikim discovered that Hitler was going to attack Russia, Rav Shlomko Zvil said, if he would have continued on his original path, he would have been completely successful, but his heavenly angel confused him. Listen to this. The Husatino Rebbe was told that Hitler declared war on Russia, and he said, now the downfall of the wicked will begin. Rabbi Yehuda Fataya explained what happened to Hitler habilistically. He said Hitler should have attacked Palestine from the north as he had a foothold in Syria. But the angels, due to the prayers of the Jewish people, switched the letters Syria to Russia, Rabbi Yehuda Fataya said. And Hitler was confused and he made a blunder and he went to Russia. Rommel suspected something may change in Alamein. He wrote to his wife that if anything goes wrong in Alamein, it could have very grave consequences. But there was another little-known miracle that took place at Alamein. There was a British 8th Army engineer named Major Peter Rayner. He records the following miracle. He says that I venture to say that the Battle of Alamein will prove to have been the decisive land battle of World War II. Had things gone different, Suez Canal would have been lost. Mediterranean Sea would have become an Axis lake. But as the battle broke, 1,100 German soldiers surrendered immediately. What happened? Thirsted them in. They're encamped in the desert for 36 hours. There was a pipeline running water through the desert. But the engineers of the Brits happened to be testing the pipeline. At that moment, the Germans tapped into the pipeline hoping to get some water. They happened to be testing the pipeline. The Brits happened to be testing the pipeline with seawater. They drank the salty seawater. It brought their thirst to delirium. They became so famished. 1,100 of them surrendered. Nase, Gadal, Haya, Sham. Ramo begins to withdraw his troops to the position he held before the attack. Hitler is told that Ramo's retreating. Hitler is furious. He sends word to Ramo. In your situation, there is no other option but to, per to persevere. Therefore, you can offer your tro troops one path, victory or death. Rommel knew he had to withdraw, but nobody disobeys an order of the Fuhrer, so he sends a messenger back to Hitler to plead to rescind his decree. The next day, Hitler replies in view of the way things are going, I approve, I approve your request. July 20th, 1944, a bomb planted in Hitler's headquarters explodes, but providence has it that Hitler was not killed. But some of the plotters implicated Rommel in the assassination plot. Now, Hitler was not sure if Rommel was in on, in on the plot. But one thing he knew, that Rommel did not support him the way he used to. So due to Rommel's high standing with German people, Hitler sent two top generals to Rommel's house. And he was given one of two options. He could either be arraigned before a people's court, or he could take the cyanide tablet the two generals provided him with. He chose the latter. So Rommel speaks to his wife, speaks to his son. He goes into the car. Soon after, they arrive at the hospital with Rommel's body, claiming he died of a heart attack. Rommel was given a state funeral. He, Hitler sent a personal representative. Nobody knew the details of Rommel's death until after the war. Rommel went Meigra, Rama, Labira, Amikta. He went from the highest pinnacle. He was at the doorstep of Palestine. The Middle East was in his hand. And shortly after, he was reduced to taking his own life. This is the power that the Jewish people have when we come together in prayer. You know, in 1942, the Ger Rebbe came to Eretz Yisrael, the Imre Yemes, Rebbe Avram Martcha. 
and he was instrumental in these public prayer groups. One of them in the fall of 1942 was held in the Chorbashul of Rabbi Dachasid. Over 400 Rabbanim attended this event, and the weekly Agoda paper, Haderach, published an account of the atmosphere of the time. It was an atmosphere of gloom and mourning. Many had gathered to say to Hillam even before the event opened officially. And when the Ger Rebbe and his sons entered, Rav Herzog, who was the chief rabbi of Palestine, climbed up the steps to the Aron Kodesh and he started off the ceremony. He said, in the name of the Holy Torah, in the name of all the Rabbanim of Eretz Yisrael, in the name of all the Rabbanim who have arrived as refugees, foremost among them the Ger Rebbe, this Atzeres Tfila has begun. And they honored the Ger Rebbe with opening up the Aron Kodesh. The Ger Rebbe couldn't walk well. He couldn't speak clearly. And he's assisted up to the podium by Rav Herzog and the Ger Rebbe's son, the Leif Simcha. The Ger Rebbe said, Eis tzara hili yakov umimenu yivasha. So the Ger Rebbe, we have to come together and unite and pray together to uproot the evil from this world. Our job is, Ish esreihu ya'azoiru uli'achiv yoimar chazak. Each man, each woman must help their friend and say, be strong. Said the Ger Rebbe, when we come together, nothing will stand in our way. Dear friends, what could be a more appropriate topic when we see every day in our times what is nothing short of a continuation of what happened 70 years ago? What we see are not isolated events. It's b'chol dar v'dar oimdim aleinu l'chalaiseinu. You know, my father shared with me one of the ga'inim in Poland, Rabbi Shul Mikutna, says, you know, what's the juxtaposition in the Haggadah? B'chol dar v'dar oimdim aleinu l'chalaiseinu. Seyu l'mad ma'bikesh lavan harami l'asos l'yakov. You know, what do the two things have to do with each other? And Rabbi Shul Mikutna said, if you think it's an exaggeration when the Haggadah says b'chol dar v'dar oimdim aleinu, you think, well, it's not in every generation. Don't we have a Medina Shal Chesed? So the Haggadah says, what do you think Lavan was? Lavan was a sweet talker. Lavan tells Yaakov, you know, don't work for me for free. You're not my brother. I'll pay you. Lavan tells Yaakov, you didn't even give me an opportunity to kiss my daughters. But Lavan was even worse. Lavan Bikesh Lakar Es Hakar. So don't think it's an exaggeration that it's Bechal Darvadar. It's not only the Paroi. It's not only the Hitler. It's also the Lavan. It's, it's Seyu Lamad. You have to go out and learn it. But if you learn it, you'll see it. When the Jewish people were in Mitzrayim, the, Ramba, the Ramban writes, we really should have been there longer. We were not worthy to be redeemed. Says the Ramban, They cried out, they increased their prayer, and Hashem could not say no. That's what happened 70 years ago in the land of Israel. There is no explanation for why Ramel was stopped in his tracks at El Alamein, other than the power of the unified prayer of the Jewish people. And that koyach and that power, we still have at our disposal. So, it gives us all great chizok and great encouragement to come together tonight to commemorate the lives of the Kedoshim, to commemorate the deaths of these holy Jews, the lives of the survivors. I live with it every day of my life. My grandfather was uh, very, and my grandmother were very dear to me, and we live with their memory. But never forget what happened at El Alamein and the power that the Tzibor has when we all come together, Ke'ish Echad, Belev Echad, that if we're Tzoaku, Bahar Beit Tfila, the Gemara tells us in Rosh Hashanah, Tzioin He, Doiresh Einla, nobody seeks out Tzioin, says the Gemara, Meklal Debo'i Drisha. From here we learn we have to seek her out. 
says Reb Chaim Knievsky, how do you seek out Sion? He says, Doiresh means to be toivea her, to ask for her, to demand her from the Rebbe Nishalem. So in that merit, in the merit of us gathering together, in the merit of us taking inspiration to increase our prayer, increase our tefillah, increase our unity, we hope for the day that we don't have to come together to commemorate the Kedoshim of the Shoah. We hope to commemorate the great consolation of the Gula Shlema and the Bias Goyal Tzedek. May it come speedily in our times. Amen. 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 Yeah, Shukachacha Rabbi Glastein for that powerful and eye-opening talk. Um, a public service reminder, tonight is the 13th day of the Omer. I don't know when you'd have Marv. To conclude the program, I call upon Rav Kenny Mattel to lead us in singing Achenu Kol Beis Yisrael. Achenu Kol Beis Thank you, Rav Kenny. In closing, I'd like to extend the Hakar Satoyev to Rav Gladstein for a fascinating and meaningful presentation, to all the sponsoring shuls, to Rabbi Marcus, to Rabbi Rosenfeld, Rabbi Rosenberg for their assistance, to Rabbi Ari Schoenfeld for hosting the Zoom program, to Chazak and the Queen's Jewish Link for promotion, and to all of you for joining us. Um, we will distribute through the same sources as we got the rest of the public out um, a link to be able to watch the program or recommend it to other people, or you can ask, uh, you can check on Torah anytime. I believe they'll have it pretty soon. May our learning and tefillahs be as chus for the neshamas of the Kedosh HaShoa, and may we all be zaycha to the B.S. God Tzedek from Harry Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Go ahead. I think you pressed record, right? I did. So, okay, so you have to press stop record.